This is Karen Rizzo. She's a speech uh, language pathologist at uh, Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. And her area of interest are, and expertise is working with children and families impacted by dysphagia, which is essentially feeding challenges, which I know a lot of our kids have issues with, um, and fluency, which she'll probably explain exactly what that means. Um, and she's, she's been um, with the Division of Speech Pathology there for uh, over eight years. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. A fluency, just to address what he just said, what Ken just said, um, is stuttering. That's how I became interested in this field. Usually the challenges we uh, live with in our lives um, cause us to grow up and want to do something because we got to help somebody but, um, or be part of a, someone's life who had a challenge. My brother stutters. He still stutters to this day, and that's why I became a speech pathologist. So. Um, our field is so wide, so many opportunities, so, and that's why I'm doing feeding and swallowing. So <laughs> who knows how those two things go together, but it's, um, it's what I'm doing now. So, okay, um, I think that I know other people will filter in, so I'll kind of um, go slow, but I'm hoping to keep you uh, only until maybe 4.15 at the latest. I was thinking about 45 minutes, so. Um, how many of you out there have kids who are are wondering about feeding and swallowing or have kids who are um, not eating by mouth or eating partially by mouth and partially another way and would like more information. Okay, I see Ken's hand up. And yes, yours. Okay. Yes. Oh, good. Okay. And um, I'll start and I'll, I'll finish up and then we can go through some questions, but keep those in mind um, what questions you might have. So hopefully I'll answer some of them for you. So I'm going to go through a couple of definitions couple of things you might see in kids who have the 1P36 deletion diagnosis, uh, reasons why, and then how we manage that, how, what, what assessments might be involved, and then what treatment you might seek to you know, find out what to do about it. And then at the end, I'm going to go over some goals about um, what you would set up to help your child improve in the feeding and swallowing areas. So I put up some terms. Uh, as Ken said, dysphagia is the disorder of feeding. And in any stage of the swallow, you know there are three or four stages of a swallow. Starts in the oral phase, which is your mouth. And then the pharyngeal phase, which is your throat. And then the esophageal phase, which of course is your esophagus. And then how respiration is combined to affect maybe the swallow at any place along those stages. So it's a very integrated process. It involves a lot of um, cranial nerves, a lot of muscles, um, and it's you know it's a very neurological process. So um, a little bit about that. I'm going to try to find out how I get my pointer on here. Which button do I push, Ken, for the the laser? Oh, he's not hearing me. Let's see. That's okay. Okay, um, and then I put up deglutition, which is chewing and swallowing. Deglutition apnea, when the infant stops breathing for extended time while swallowing. That can happen with kids who have cardiac and respiratory and sometimes gastroesophageal issues. Video swallow study, has anybody in here had a child with a video swallow study? Okay, so you know about that and how that works and it's under fluoroscopy. And then a fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of the swallow, which is a FEES. Does anybody have familiarity with a FEES study? Any of your kids had a FEES study? Okay. That is actually seeing true structures because they use an endoscope with an ear, nose, and throat physician. And we have the child eat while we're looking at the top part of their airway. Uh, hypotonia, you all, probably all know, low tone. External pacing is a feeding technique we use when an infant or even a young child needs help to coordinate sucking or sipping, swallowing and breathing. Um, penetration is what you might see on a video swallow study where material, liquid or food might hit the top of the vocal cords and then be uh, swallowed down into the esophagus and not enter through the vocal cords. But on that same hand, aspiration is when the material will go right through the vocal cords and aspirate into the trachea and then ultimately, unless the child has a cough response, ultimately go into the lungs. And then pharyngonasal reflux, 
The material food liquid enters up from the throat into the nose, usually due to a weak palate or um, a you know, cleft of some kind, a bifid uvula where the uvula is split because the contact of the soft palate in the back of the mouth doesn't quite strongly push against the back wall of the throat. So the food or liquid will come up through the nose. Okay, so for kids who are diagnosed with 1P36 deletion, we consider the um, different symptoms, the different characteristic of that um, actual um, syndrome to understand how feeding and swallowing might be affected. So I put up information there that I know you've all seen, percentages of the general hypotonia, so 95% percent of kids will experience that and in turn experience dysphagia somewhere along the phase of the swallow because weakness in the swallow can affect swallow ability. Um, it's weakness in the body anywhere for that matter. Uh, or Kids might have an oral facial cleft which will affect the swallow. Structural brain characteristics again because swallowing is very neurological. Seizures again neurological can have an effect on the swallow. Congenital heart diagnoses, which can cause um, a different kind of setup for suck swallowing breathing, because if your heart is working hard to oxygenate your blood and you're trying to breathe, breathing comes before swallowing, so you might have to breathe more often than you actually need to swallow. So that's where we put pacing in there to help kids who do need a different time schedule to help them still be able to eat by mouth at least some, to practice that skill. And then gastrointestinal intestinal anomalies, um, eye and vision problems, like visual inattention, being able to focus um, and pay attention for the eating task. That's important part of the eating, of our feeding behavior, is being able to pay attention to what's going on. And if you can't, maybe do something else that will help you be able to hone in or focus on what's going on. Behavior challenges can be a big part of feeding difficulty. Um, hypothyroidism, if the child is not gaining weight or growing. And then hearing loss, of course, because sometimes it's overwhelming to do things in other areas of the body when you can't hear very well. So we talk about maybe having some visual cues for the kids to let them know what's coming, what's happening next, what time is it, it's meal time, that kind of thing. So we can have some difficult or some possible difficulties, including sucking, oral motor coordination challenges, difficulty with suck or sip, chew, swallow, and breathe coordination. If a child has gastroesophageal reflux, especially as an infant, if they have low tone and they end up with gastroesophageal reflux and food or liquid is, tr is coming up from the stomach at the same time the child is trying to swallow from above, that can be challenging and, and mess up that coordination. Uh, vomiting, of course, um, which can cause a negative association with eating because they have so much reflux, they're vomiting all the wet time and they have that memory um, as, you know, in, in their infancy or their early, you know, baby stage of eating. And then growth and weight gain challenges. So feeding and swallowing, you can have mild, according to the study I read, one of them, mild to severe oral pharyngeal dysphagia has been observed on swallow studies in 72% of kids who have 1P36 deletion. Um, and then children with weakness of oral motor structures, the tongue, the lips, the cheeks may show liquid loss, difficulty extracting fluid, and reduced energy and endurance. So if you're wondering if your child might be having trouble feeding and you're not quite sure, there are certain signs and symptoms to just pay attention to and understand a little bit about to decide, yes, this is a challenge that we're going to have to work through and to get the help as soon as you can. So failure to, failure to thrive is the first um, bullet up there. Reduced endurance to feed. They take a lot of energy to feed so they get tired. The, the baby will get tired while it is taking a bottle or nursing. A weak suck and you notice that sometimes because like it, that child might have trouble taking a pacifier or if you go to reach for the pacifier it might just fall right out of the child's mouth. Uh, you might see gagging, coughing or choking 
along with those things, refusal to feed, turning their head away from the bottle or the source of the food, which is very hard because that's the main thing that a parent wants to do is feed their child and it becomes very challenging and if they won't eat, it can get a little bit more persistent and, and parents can get a little nervous about if the child doesn't eat, they won't gain weight and so you have a cycle of a little bit of, um, in some cases, maybe some force feeding and then that again is a negative association to eat. So you want to get that help right away. Um, Oral feeding coordination difficulty, I wrote suck, swallow, breathe up there for the little um, acronym SSB. If the child is losing a lot of food out of their mouth or liquid out of their mouth, if feedings are taking too long, an infant feeding typically will take 20 minutes as long as the child is awake and when they're really young they don't stay awake long, but 20 to no longer than 30 minutes even for a toddler. Um, food or liquid evident coming from the nose, again that's the uh, pharyngonasal reflux that I spoke about earlier and then gastroesophageal reflux which I mentioned before. A lot of times kids who have severe or significant enough gastroesophageal reflux day after day are most likely going to have some trouble swallowing. In fact when you have repeated gastroesophageal reflux that is either not treated or it's the medicine's not working that reflux can reduce the sensation that the child, the feeling that the child will have in the throat area. So the aspiration or the penetration or the swallowing difficulty can get worse, it can be exacerbated. So it's very important early on to recognize gastroesophageal reflux and work with your gastrointestinal team or physicians to make sure that's well treated. So when you want to manage the feeding and swallowing difficulty in the child with 1P36, um, you want to consider the assessments. And those will include the clinical oral motor feeding assessment, which is usually done by a speech pathologist, sometimes an occupational therapist. You want to have a proper assessment with the instrumental swallowing um, evaluation, which can be the fees or the video swallow study. Uh, you want to have an assessment of the palate to make sure that palate is working right so the food or liquid is not coming up through the palate. And if it is, if there's anything that can be done or watched for or some um, devices that can make it easier for the child to more safely eat and not get food or liquid up their nose. Um, then the a gastroesophageal reflux assessment and treatment, again, very important. And then referral to a dysphagia team. So. Most of the time the speech pathologist will work with the occupational therapist because usually um, sensory difficulties, challenges are associated with the swallowing difficulty and we work closely with OTs. Dietitians are so important because we have to help families with the feeding part and the oral motor part and the sensory part, but families have a lot of questions about, well, what's normal for my two-year-old to take? Like how many, how much fruit? What's a serving of fruit? What's a serving of vegetables? What's a serving of protein and, and the grains? So you have to work closely with the dietitian to manage through that. And some kids, I don't know if any of you have had kids, uh, your own children, who don't show a hunger cycle. Does that happen? To, does, do you, does anybody in here feel like their child doesn't show that they're hungry? Have a hunger cry. Yeah. Yes. That's, and, and that's very common. Well, with a team, a medical team of professionals that can work with you because you were referred to a dysphagia team, they can help you identify that that truly is an issue, why that might be an issue for your child, and also why, um, what, if there's a medication that can help your child build a hunger, because there are some medications. Yes? Is it possible, like, uh, my half son has most of those things, and he's G2 fed, and uh -huh. has dirt and all that, you know, stuff. But uh, my, uh, my uh, GI doctor thinks that he, his, part, part of his 1P36 is that his brain doesn't recognize the cues for satiation mm. and hunger. Mm. Well, the doctor usually knows what he's talking about. So, as far as the, <laughs> as far as that medical piece and the neurological piece of that, I believe I've heard the physicians we work with have mentioned that. And yes, it is a neurological signal that our body, you know, all of our regulation is done is 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 um, controlled by our brains. So that would make sense to me. 
There are other factors, though, that you can test your child's ability to have hunger or to be trained to, to have hunger and even know. It's like, for example, is your son bolus fed by G-tube or continuous? So his belly isn't ever used to getting full and then digesting the food and shrinking back up. So if he could tolerate, by the physician's guidance, a bolus feed, then you can start talking about and understanding, is that really true? So I give my son a uh, six ounce bolus, I know it's an MLs, but like a six ounce bolus of, of, his, of his formula, and I let, and he tolerates it. I mean, that's a big piece, they have to tolerate. If they're vomiting and that kind of thing, then that's hard because you work with the doctor to get them there. But if he tolerates that, digests three hours later, four hours later, you notice he's acting fussy, like he wants more of something, it won't happen right away because his body has to get used to that, but over time, you'll be able to tell, oh, he, does, he is getting hungry. Oh. Okay. Right. Right. And how old is he? Eight. Eight years old. Okay. So you wonder, could he be retrained to have a little bit of hunger? And how long has it been since he's tried a bolus feed? You know, you could work with your doctor to enter entertain that again for him, maybe. Usually we start feeding therapy and are able to help kids eat by mouth after they're successful managing bolus feeds. Does everybody know what a bolus feed is? So all, yes, so the full amount goes in in a short period of time versus a continuous feed where an ounce might be fed over one hour and then the next hour another ounce might be fed in a pump. So um, eating by mouth is bolus feeding. It's just going in a different way. Yeah. Yeah, and he'll do a little bit of that. So maybe, yeah. So we can get more, I don't want to say aggressive, but we can get, uh, we, can, we can have a larger goal to eat by mouth for bolus feed when we know the kids are working with the doctors and the dietitian to manage and handle their body to control a, a, or um, tolerate a bolus feed. That starts first. So, um, okay. Any other questions about that for now? No? Okay. Okay, so you got your assessment, and now let me talk a little bit about treatment. And what I did is I broke it down into the feeding therapy and then some feeding techniques and devices. They go hand in hand, but you can kind of break them down and think about them in this, these two areas. So first of all, um, you can see my list there. I'm going to go through each of these points on the following slides. So. In the treatment, the oral motor skills can be nutritive or non-nutritive. Nutritive means you're eating, you're practicing, the kids are practicing the skill while they're receiving nutrition by mouth. So that makes, you know, makes it much easier if they're able to tolerate that. Um, and we use and practice with spoons, cups, straws, different textures, and then also flavor varieties. Um, and, and I'm sorry, varieties of food textures and flavors. And then non-nutritive, toothbrushing is huge and a lot of kids who are hypersensitive or tactilely defensive, they don't like toothbrushing, but toothbrushing is obviously an important part of their health because you want them to have healthy teeth and healthy bacteria in their mouths and not swallowing you know, um, bacteria that, that, that is on their teeth from plaque and that kind of thing. So what we do is use that piece in our therapy sessions to help the child improve and get more accepted or have a, a higher tolerance, a better tolerance for toothbrushing and things in their mouths. So we use songs and we tell the kids what we're doing and, and we, ha we, have, um, we might tell them or count one, two, three, out. One, two, three, out. So then they know to predict and it helps them reduce their anxiety. When is this going to be over with kind of thing. We start real small and we gradually work up and then hopefully the kids will be able to tolerate some at home because that will happen every day. So and um, sometimes it's hard because you've got to brush your kids teeth but we try to make it, um, we, we try to give families ideas and strategies to make it a little bit easier. Um, and then oral exploration toys like a chewy tube or a tri-chew. Has any 
the, I brought a couple of these devices. You all can come up and look. Um, I'm going to mention some things, but a chewy tube to help with jaw stability and kind of some resistance activity. A tri chew that has different textures and it's very, very soft and flexible. Um, and if kids don't bite very hard and, and aren't, don't have all of their back teeth, so this is more for a infant, early, young toddler that won't bite through it because it is soft, but it has different textures. Uh, we have Nook brushes, which are good for the tooth brushing. P's and Q's, which are really nice because they're, they're pliable and they're meant for jaw exercising. And I have all of this up here too. And um, also Ken put my, is linking the presentation to the website too. So you guys can look some of that stuff up. Um, and then oral learning activities like cold washcloths, like just whatever we can to keep things in the kids' mouths and to keep them accepting those things as part of their routine. So I put cold washcloths on there because I um, sometimes suggest the taking those smaller, thinner terry cloth washcloths, rolling them up and um, putting a little water on them and freezing them and then letting the kids do some oral alerting activities with the cold and then later if they like that you can do some flavor um, exposures with juices you can freeze the washcloth with the juice on it just to see if they're interested in some of that stimulation in their mouth and it I'm not with the juice so much but with the water it could even kind of help with the teeth cleaning too Okay, and then treatment for some of the sensory skills. So the sensory piece is evaluated by the occupational therapist. Um, after the occupational therapist sees a child and we work together as a team to do some of the treatment, we help the kids get used to the idea of food again. Because some of them, because of their past experience with early on with reflux or heart issues or just needing to be in the hospital and, and get well and be able to survive, those um, we need to help them know, okay, now you're okay. So now we're going to get you used to the process again, but we're going to do it really slowly. So first we're going to help the kids get used to seeing, smelling, then touching, then playing with sensory non-food and food items so they can touch and feel and, and um, smell and not necessarily take a spoon from a jar and go right to their mouth. We want them to get used to it first because they already have um, memories of things where they're just not so sure it, and they didn't trust the foods before. Now they're better. Well, they still don't trust them because they don't know they're better, but we, our, us parents know they're better. So we're going to go ahead and try to help them slowly through the process. It's called a gradual exposure um, kind of um, uh, technique, I guess you could call it. Um, so we are going to be aware of the unique child offering visual and or auditory cues if needed. Some kids need a picture of chewing. Some kids need a, uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of video modeling to help kids learn, but some kids like to watch a video. And so we might show kids a video of someone smelling a food, someone touching a food, someone tasting a food, and then maybe sometimes some, finally somebody eating a food and the kids like that. Um, and then, of course, I already said the hierarchy of acceptance or uh, desensitizing them to the food by tolerating it, smelling it, touching it, tasting it, and eating it, um, eating the food, finally. And then we try to calibrate or get in touch with if your child gags, how do you respond as, as the parent? You know, we might get nervous too if we see that action and that activity. So we want to try to help families understand what's going on and how to kind of keep a neutral tone throughout. Not get overexcited about any one thing, not, you know, just neutral. And then um, I'll tell you a little bit about other interaction things and later in my slideshow. And then mealtime behavior and an interaction skill support. So first we help families understand to help their child make an association between when I get my tube feeding, whether it's a little continuous still or a, a bolus feed, when I get my tube feeding, my family's also eating. And I might even be sitting in my um, booster seat or my high chair and I'm going to, if it's possible, get my feeding while or maybe right after my family eats. But, I, but I'll be participating in the routine. Kids thrive on routines and expectations. So we want them to correlate. My tum, food is going in my tummy 
and I'm also smelling foods, and my family's eating, and I might even be tasting foods. They associate eating with their belly feeling like it's getting full. Uh, we try to help families understand if they don't already have something set up or structured meal times for hunger and full expected routines. And again, I, I wrote up there to work with a dietitian on that. But so if our kids know, even if the kids who aren't eating uh, fully by mouth know that we eat like three meals a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and maybe two snacks, and we usually don't eat every hour, our bodies are expected to eat a breakfast and maybe in three hours we get hungry again, so we'll eat again. And we want the kids who are being tube fed or learning again to eat by mouth to have that idea too. So we work with families to figure out how to set that up. As in, sometimes it's easier said than done, I know, because it's probably not easy to feed a child by tube when you're trying to eat yourself. So we figure out ways that'll work for the family with you. And then we try to encourage environmental routines, like I said, high chair, family together, the same room, minimal distraction as much as possible. Enjoying, even if the child might just be playing in a puree food or a pudding, they're still part of that social meal time and it's still part of the routine of eating in the kitchen or, or in the family room, wherever the person might, their family might eat. And then we assess and incorporate cue-based feeding. So at our, we, at our facility at Children's, we don't do a whole lot of behavior treatment. Like um, we do positive reinforcement, but we don't do a whole lot of punishment if they don't take a bite or, or some of the techniques are called extinction. We'll do a couple of things where we don't remove the spoon, but we won't chase the spoon. You know, we don't want to make it unpleasant. We want them to keep we want the kids to keep wanting to come back for more. So we try to keep it, you know, pretty, uh, we, we follow their lead, we follow their cues, we feed with permission. So we really want to watch for their signs that they're ready to take a bite. Um, and if they're not, and you try for five or 10 minutes, that's okay. And on a positive note, meal time's over, we'll practice again in about, you know, two hours or something like that. So. Um, we try to offer visual and verbal praise, give reinforcements, kind of like Emily was talking about. The child's learning to drink from an open cup. We give them a small sip and they accept it, so right away we blow them bubbles. Or right away we give them the iPad to look at or, or do one five minute game. I mean, right away, because we want them to learn the skill. We want them to be motivated to learn the skill, so we do whatever we can to reinforce more of that same behavior. Um, and then we do imitation and naming of behavior. So the kids, if you're eating, they want to do what you're doing if they are able to see what you're doing. And we want to tell them, especially if they have some visual challenges, we want to say, take a bite or you can tell them what they're having. I have a bite of green beans for you. Let's touch it first. You know, don't underestimate the power of your being able to speak to them to help them understand to make it easier to accept. So I have a couple of thoughts here for cues from babies and children. The head is facing toward the feeding source, the room, the place, the feeder. They move in the direction of the feeding source. Uh, they, if they're not verbal, they might cry or complain, complain um, that they're hungry. Some kids might even tell you they're hungry. Some kids might even just pull on you or take you to the refrigerator or something, and, but they're going to let you know. Open mouth posture for an infant, rooting reflex, wanting to eat, telling you they're hungry. These are all hunger signs. Tongue position low in the mouth to accept food is in the infant. And then they're reaching for food too. So there's a baby ready to eat or yawning. I don't know. I couldn't decide, but I thought it was cute. <laughs> so mouth open. The tongue is low in the mouth. You can see and they might be reaching over. Maybe that baby, even as young as that baby, can see a bottle and, and be ready to eat. And then this is a, a cute little picture of Carter. Uh, he is um, looking like he's ready to play in his high chair, but still, he's set up for a pleasant time in his high chair, smiling, maybe even smiling because his parents getting some food ready for him. So on to some more, to the feeding techniques and devices. Positioning is so important and for feeding, and OTs can help you and help the therapist find ultimate positions or, or um, 
the best position for your child to eat. You definitely want trunk support and alignment of the head with the body, with the middle of the body, with the trunk. You consider feeding in a slight reclined high chair or infant car seat, possibly side lying. Infants and young kids who can tolerate feeding in a cradle hold that's fine, but kids who have low tone, a cradle hold is not the optimal position for them. So you work with a the therapist to try to figure out what would be the best position to support their head and neck alignment and to support ultimately their feeding. Uh, the head neutral or slightly flexed, like into the little bit of a chin tuck position, and the feeder next to the child instead of in front. So when you hold a child, either an infant all the way up to a child who can still sit in your lap and you try to feed them, that's challenging because not only are you working your own body to keep them in a position, but their own body is working to help to support them. And so they're doing more work to support their body versus all the work they could do to get the pressure off so they can work on their uh, mouth skills, their oral motor skills. Uh, and a, a reason for that is you're fighting against the low tone reflux possibly in a cradle hold position and airway issues and all of those are going to trump swallowing in and of itself and so if we're supporting a position that isn't the best support for for um, you know helping maybe reduce that reflux or helping them breathe better we need to reconsider how we're positioning the kids um, so and if you have in the high chair or the car seat um, less uh, effort is needed to keep the head erect, which is the most important thing. So, okay, um, positioning in the 90-90-90 in body support for eating. Has anybody ever heard of 90-90-90? That's a really important, especially if you have an older child who really is getting better with sitting upright. They might not be able to sit upright by themselves yet, but the 90-90-90 is 90 degree angle at the hips, a 90 degree angle at the knees, and a 90 degree angle at the ankles. All stable, supported, and then the head supported if needed. So this would ensure safe swallowing, good digestion, adequate breathing, participation in social activities because they're sitting up looking at you. Facilitates development of fine motor and visual motor activities. And then I have a star down at the bottom because then the energy that the child is using is being spent on the working of the mouth because the body is now st stable and not having to swim around to support itself while you're trying to support the mouth. A, a more stable um, base will help the mouth be able to work better. So here's some examples. There's a seat that looks like a high chair there on the left, and it has seat belts and then a tray, and that little foot rest can come down so that the ankles then will be in a 90 degree angle. The hips moved back. Sometimes if the hips, I don't know if you guys have kids with low tone, their hips will slip forward. So I'll take like a piece of shelf liner or something that's got a skid, like OTs will have Dyson, uh, like a Dyson sheet. And we'll put that right on the seat so that their body does, the slide doesn't happen as easily. And then there's a younger girl there with the 90-90-90 positioning. And you notice her elbows are up on the tray. Elbows up also help with trunk support too. So a little bit about facial support in the jaws, the cheeks, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about pacing. So with, if you have an infant or a young child who's still bottle feeding, with the jaw, I'm going to show you a picture of a technique that is used to help support the jaw. You can see the back of the hand there, that, that person's left hand is cradling the back of the neck, and the thumb is up pushing on the cheek because infants have a fat pad inside their mouth, and that helps put compression against the nipple to help them feed better that thumb is being used in lieu of the inside of the cheek because the child has low tone and has not yet developed the fat pads to help the sucking, um, uh, the pressure to suck. So it's helping that, supporting that child to be more efficient. And then the bottle is being held, obviously, in the right hand. 
and you can't see the pinky, but it's on the other side, supporting the other the side of the jaw, and then the ring finger is supporting the cheek from the other side. It's amazing what that technique, how that technique helps. I, I've read about it, and I read a study about it, and I've done it myself, and it, it really sometimes makes a difference between a child being able to take a volume that's sufficient for their feed, just because you're doing those things to support their tone um, and their uh, feeling of stability to eat. So I'll go back there. And then cup drinking. For the facial support, usually what we do for a cup drinking is we teach families to go behind the child, give them jaw support, and then we'll hold the cup for them, or the child can hold the cup, just so they have a place to rest their jaw. We help them kind of go behind, and we put our hand up at the where their um, jaw kind of curves there at the bottom of their face, and just give them something to rest on, and it really helps them become more stable and use their skills a little bit more efficiently. We always, if we're going to help a child go from a bottle to a cup, we always start with a thickened liquid, just maybe a little bit, like a nectar, or if some kids need a little thicker, we might do a honey type of viscosity or consistency. But the reason why is because that child is learning a new oral motor skill, and they already have some reduced tone. So we want the liquid to stay slower than the motor movements are cap are you know can handle. So if the child is just learning a new skill, the food or the liquid will get lost pretty quick, and then you'll have coughing and choking on the thin liquid. In fact, that happens with every child learning to go from a um, a bottle to a cup. They might get the skill, the flow is way too fast, and the liquid is way too thin, and then they have coughing and choking. So we start to stay ahead, the oral motor skills have to stay ahead of the food you're actually feeding the child, the liquid. Usually it's liquid that slips away quickly. And then spoon feeding, of course. There's a picture I have of someone supporting a child with spoon feeding. Just giving that child the back of the neck, they're giving them a little bit of support because otherwise they're coming forward and fighting against, like trying to sit up, like overcorrecting, sitting up. So that therapist is holding the back of the head just so the child has some place, a stable point, and then can open his mouth and take the food from the spoon a little bit better. Let's see if I have that. And then I have a note about pacing, the simple technique of pacing. So we will just slow down how quickly or how, you know, slow down the delivery of the feeding or the meal by offering external pacing on the bottle, which would look like this. We we assess and recognize how many sips the child has to take before they need to breathe. Because if kids keep sucking and they don't take a break to breathe, their body will take a break to breathe automatically because breathing trumps eating. And so guess what? They're probably sucking at the same time their body's trying to breathe. So we'll break that. We'll take the bottle and just tip it down. Give them a second to breathe because their body's going to breathe anyways, and we'll put it back up, and the child will continue. So usually we'll do like three sucks, take a bite, take a break. Three sucks, take a break. And depending, some kids, after we've done that for a while, they learn, their bodies learn to, to automatically pace themselves, which is very helpful. And then I have a little bit, I put some examples up on some, uh, some of the, the actual... Uh, devices we might use to help kids who uh, might be diagnosed with 1P36. The Haberman feeder where the pacing and the um, actual delivery, the amount of liquid that the child can suck is controlled. Then the Mead Johnson Clef palate feeder, that has a longer nipple and it goes further in the mouth so that it will bypass the if there's a cleft in the roof of the mouth. And it offers, since a, if a child has a cleft in their mouth, it will reduce the ability to um, get a good suck. The pressure won't be the same. So they can't really suck the fluid out, and we give that, that bottle's a squeeze bottle. So we watch them and give them a delicate squeeze every couple of sucks, so they actually are expelling a little bit more liquid that they can tolerate. And then the Bionics Control Flow Baby Feeder, that looks like that. That starts out very small, so babies who can't eat by mouth can at least still get some stimulation by mouth. That small of an amount, and then it can graduate up to a certain number of mLs, so the child can get a certain volume, but it controls. And there's a standard and a 
premature um, model. And then cups and straws, I brought some of those too. So again, what we want to do is just give families and, and kids the familiarity with some tools that families can maybe try at home with their kids just to slow down the rate of the delivery of liquid and to help them maybe transition if they're seven or eight years old and sippy cup is getting old and their child wants to now you know try to have a open cup <laughs> and it's really hard for them to learn that because the fluids flowing quickly and so I brought some of those cups um, and I have them some of them here in pictures so I'll show you those uh, the reflow smart cup is this one it's got a little thing inside that just controls how much is given at once so you can't guzzle it but and uh, you guys can all come up and look at them in a little bit um, all, most of these devices are all, by the way, from the website called Beyond Play. I don't know, Beyond Play, or from Amazon.com. You can also find them, too. The Raiji cup is a cup with big handles. It looks like a lava lamp. And there's a little valve inside that you control. And the child, at one time, can get as small as 3 mLs, which is less than a teaspoon of full... Uh, fluid at once and it won't refill so they can't guzzle it down they have to put it back down and then the reservoir will fill back up and then they can so it teaches them one sip at a time and only allows them a small drink at a time so they can still have the ability to drink and eat by mouth and still keep that you know that system working and then the sip tip cup I have up here that's this one and then a honey bear, which maybe some of you have seen and some of you maybe used, to help kids learn how to drink from a straw. And there are straw, control straw valves too that you can put on the end of a straw to allow a child to only get a certain amount of volume at one time. And also when they work hard to suck the liquid up, the liquid will stay up in the straw, it won't go back down into the cup. So all that work they did isn't for nothing. They, it'll stay there. And so when they go back to suck to try again, the liquid can start where they left off. So here's the Reflow Smart Cup, which I have right here. And that valve right shows you their valves and the colors it comes in. Here's the Infotrainer Cup, and I have that right here. It again has a flow control. It helps the child learn how to drink from an open cup, but in small amounts. Honey Bear, I have that as well. And then the sip tip, I also have that. So a little bit about the different techniques we might use. Um, placement of spoons and food items. First, when we help a child learn how to eat some foods, we have a technique to start at the side of the mouth because the front of the mouth and the middle of the mouth is way too offensive. So we help fam and also it helps the child get more movement side to side with their tongue, which they need to chew and tolerate more solid foods. So we do lateral pl placement, meaning at the side molars. It helps decrease gagging. It helps lateral tongue movement, meaning side to side tongue movement. It helps decrease the amount of food spilling out of the mouth. And it, um, there's a three step process with support steps. Enter the mouth, you place and you remove the spoon. And the therapist usually helps to you to see the value of each of these steps that Otherwise, we kind of take for granted. We just put the spoon in our mouth and we're done. Well, there's, there can be more to it. Um, so continuing with placement of spoons, transitioning to a larger spoon then. We want the child to increase their volume. So guess what? If they can now tolerate the lateral placement of small amounts because we used a smaller narrow spoon, now we're going to try to use a larger spoon. What we usually use are, are those maroon spoons. I don't know if you've all seen those. They're like a kind of a purplish color. And they have a smaller, thinner, narrow one and a, a wider bowl um, spoon. So what we're going to do is we're going to gradually present the spoon toward the center of the mouth after they tolerate lateral side placement to the side. they got to tolerate that first. And then we're going to work our way toward the center in gradual steps. And then we're going to be working towards the middle of the tongue just off center so we don't elicit a gag. And again, we don't start a negative experience for feeding. Transitioning to solid and table food, not all kids, unless they're under one, not all kids are going to start with baby food. Some of the kids with low tone 
and need a little more excitement in their environment and a little more excitement for things to stir them up and get them going, they might need more tasty things. So we help families decide how they can puree table foods and help them with real foods that are more tasty. He's okay. Um, so we talk to families about considering foods such as yogurt or pudding if their diet, nutrition, allergies, and their age are, is appropriate. Um, we help families do pureed table foods, and we have a strategy to help smooth, keep the pureed table foods smooth, very smooth, low texture, but slowly increase the thickness. So we go from pureed canned fruit, which is kind of watery, to, this is just an example, to a cream of wheat, half cream of wheat, half mix, or half canned fruit, and then we go to cream of wheat without. So we're helping them transition tastes gradually and helping them transition into thickness of foods, which thicker foods help kids learn how to chew. And then texture grading. We slowly increase the amount of graininess to fine, chop, fine chopped food to fine fork mashed foods. And we have a way to help them slowly become accustomed without you know, going from a stage two um, green beans all the way up to a mashed potato. There's a reason why, you know, I, you know, he'll he'll take a a stage two green bean out of a jar, but I try to give him mashed potatoes, and they gag on that. Well, sometimes and some kids will tolerate it, but sometimes there's a reason for that, and we help families slowly, gradually go up the process so they can enjoy mashed potatoes at the table with the family someday. And then. As far as some of the techniques we might use in the therapy, um, we do some resistive chewing activities where we will use like the P or the Q, depending on the age of the child. And we'll put that, that device up at the top of the roof of the mouth um, on the back molar area, or it might just be gums, depending on how old the child is. And we'll give a little resistance and we'll try to help them feel that resistance and respond by doing some chewing and jaw grating movement to help them with the coordination and the, like I said, the jaw grating and the strength. We help kids chew a food with using mesh. If you've ever seen the little mesh bags at the store, you can buy those. Um, I can't remember, First Steps I think has them. You can put like a cantaloupe or a strawberry or something in that um, bag. We usually recommend if the child likes stage two puree green beans, try a canned green bean in the, like, if they like, try foods they like in the bags first because they'll seek the flavor because they're already familiar and you're only changing one thing. You're, you know, they still have the flavor that's familiar. Um, there are some therapists that suggest using tool and not the commercially bought little bag, but you have to be careful because you don't want them to get a piece of that. So you'd have to really work with your therapist to know the right way, the safe way to do that. Um, so like the mesh that you can just buy, the tool that you can just buy at like the fabric store. There's a way to tie it and hold it, make it long enough, and the kids can get the, the taste and some of the texture out of that by chewing. Uh, we use whole chewable foods, and there's a breakdown of chewable foods. You start with like a very dissolvable chewable food, and there's a hierarchy of five steps to move up to. And when you're working with a therapist, the therapist can give you food lists of each of those foods, so you can think about the small change in the quality and the texture of the foods. We always recommend starting with a snack time to practice because it's less stressful. You don't have an expectation to eat a whole meal. It's a practice time for kids to get used to some new foods and some new oral motor mechanics to use the, to finally eat maybe and, and then later enjoy one of those practice foods at a meal time. Um, and then meal variety, balance, and alternate food items when first learning. That means if your child really likes and tolerates and will eat a good volume of, of pudding or yogurt, make sure that the calorie bulk of the nutrition at first during the meal is that food because they like it, they're used to it, and then maybe add the um, softer solid food that they practiced at snack time as another item, and they might, you know, take off a little bit with it, but it won't be a big volume they're taking at that meal yet. So we help families understand that piece and balance the meal so the child is set up for success. So what can we do about all this? And just to review, 
proper assessment and treatment recommendations, positioning support, facial stability techniques, watching for I'm ready cues and being willing to, when they say they're not ready, be willing to be okay with that when they give you signs. Support mealtime behavior and positive interaction. In our um, clinic, we teach a specific mode of interaction so we can help families rebuild a positive, um, uh, what do you want to say, like a, a positive experience at the table again because it's not sometimes very pleasant starting off when the child refuses or the behaviors aren't right. We help the, the families um, get some strategies to interact and talk with the child to get more of the behaviors we want to get from them during the meal time. Um, pacing and control bolus, careful food and spoon placement, gradually moving and advancing textures and providing many exposures. So just because your child for the first time, the second time, even the third time won't eat green beans, you have to, uh, that doesn't mean they don't like them. It just means, oh, they gave us the cue, we don't like them, and then we don't feed them anymore. And, of course, now they're really not going to be used to them, so they may not like them. But there's evidence out in research literature that says your child should be offered the opportunity and exposed to foods more than 20 times before you can truly decide, they don't like those green beans in the pantry. I'm not even opening those. You have to have that many exposures, and sometimes in very gradual ways. Um, see, prepare the sensory system. OT can help a family understand. Some kids need a lot of big movements before they sit in the chair to pay attention to eat. Um, Non-nutritive oral motor stimulation activities, including tooth brushing. So those are a list of some things to consider. So when you go to therapy or go to the assessment, I put up here two goals to think about when you're ready to establish these goals and do some work in those areas with your child, or maybe your child's even ready to you know, work towards these goals. So to support feeding when potential oral motor challenges are present, understand the cause of the oral motor and swallowing deficit by the full assessment, and then improve the outcome of the feeding and swallowing, supporting a successful and efficient feeding experience. So, and that's a couple references there. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah? Yes. Um, I saw one of the slides. You said uh, something to thicken up the liquid. Um, our daughter can drink out of a straw, but half of it gets in the mouth, the other half down the front. So, down the front of her, and, yeah. and I also heard you mention the little device that'll slow it down. So am I looking to that? But can you, the thing you thicken it with, is it nutritious or is it just a thickener? I mean, you... Really good question. There are a couple of thickeners. You know, there are commercial thickeners like Thick It, Simply Thick. Um, Simply Thick is a xanthan gum based. It's a gel and it really helps keep the food and the liquid. It keeps it very smooth. So people prefer that texture sometimes. There's no lumps, no clumps. It's not a powdery substance. Thicket is a cornstarch base, and so it does cause a little bit of that, more of that powdery texture and maybe clumping depending on how good a mixer you have or may, how good you're able to mix at any given time. So the xanthan gum, sometimes they recommend for the older kids. They're, it's not really recommended for the younger, like an infant um, child. Um, but what I usually recommend is I'll take a jar of baby food if the child is okay with it, and I'll take the same the same food but a juice version so like I'll take baby food applesauce and I will thin out the applesauce in a cup with the apple juice until it gets to what looks like a nectar or a smoothie and kids like that better because it's all the same you know it's just the food so I tend to lean towards using um, real foods like natural thickeners so I might even grab a gogurt smoothie because that's already a little thicker um, if you want them to just drink water, that becomes a little bit challenging, but you can use the thicker thickeners for the water. Because anything you put in water will change the taste and the texture of water. Um, there, You can buy already thickened water, too, out there. So you can Google that and, and find some products. Resource, Nestle has some. And I think I saw on one of the grocery stores around here in the pharmacy area, they sell big containers of thicket. They also have a couple of options for thickened water and some thickened juices too. So 
pretty cool. Oh, and then the straws. I was going to tell you, Bionics has a straw, and I have it in my slideshow, B-I-O-N-I-X. They have, and they have a control that you can use with a thick and liquid, too. They've got like a little valve control. So then it's nice because if she sucks it up too much and it all comes out the front, it's controlling how much she actually gets, so she'll be more successful to swallow the small amount she was able to manage in her mouth or get up in her mouth. So, anybody else? Any? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. Hi. So, um. My daughter is six weeks old, and she has really bad reflux. Well, I mean, she has reflux. Um, are there any, so we will feed her, we pace her aggressively, we keep her sitting upright for maybe 20 minutes after she eats, and then um, maybe she'll lay down and fall asleep for an hour or two, and then wake up and reflux. Is there any other things we can be doing to try to prevent that? Is there um, um, anything else maybe needs to stay up, sit up longer after she eats? Yeah. Well, I think during, while, during the time she's eating, do you notice she reflux while she's eating? No, not really. Oh, that's good. Okay, very good. So, usually the positioning, you, have you tried her in a car seat or upright in a different, like, versus a cradle hold? Has she tried usually, to eat? Usually, well, if we're, if she's not breastfeeding. Um, she is? She will breastfeed. She will breastfeed. Usually breastfeeds. Okay. Um, but if I'm, if I'm giving her a bottle, she'll be sitting up on my lap. Okay. Um, yeah. So she'll have that. So breastfeeding is um, a good thing in a sideline position yeah. because it helps. Do you already know that all of that? Yep. So that can help with the reflux, holding, slowing down the swallow, giving the cheek a little bit of, of the uh, material so you're, they're not swallowing it too quickly. I'm not exactly sure positioning wise to help with the reflux if, but she's not refluxing while she's eating, so that's good. Um, it already sounds like you're doing the positioning. Does she like swaddling? Sometimes that tight, like, on the outside, that movement, that tight feel and a compressed feel might kind of help that okay. um, issue. And does she have medicine for the reflux? Uh, no, we, we were, well, we got diagnosed a week ago, so we thought okay. that the reflux was just a, something she'd grow out of. And it probably will be. Yeah, so she's not on medication yet for right. it, but we'll okay. probably do that. Yeah. And, and as, far as, I, as far as I know, most of the medication is just antacid. Okay. Is that, is that am I correct? doctor is the best person to ask about what kind of medicine is going to be best to help with the, the actually the food not coming up and if that can't help what's going to help it be the least acidic as possible okay. because sometimes the food you know the low tone and that muscle there to to not allow the um, food from the stomach back up into the esophagus it might be just a little bit weak or open and it doesn't contain it so it's going to come up maybe no matter what you know, the positioning is awesome. It's one of the best things to do, like keeping her upright. But if it still comes up and still is very acidic, it can, you know, not necessarily be as nice to the tissues in the esophagus and the upper airway. So the doctors are best to manage that with you. And, yeah, that's a, it's a good thing because then they have better experiences associated with eating as well, less damage to the tissue of their, um, you know, esophagus and throat. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Good luck. And congratulations. Six weeks old. It's pretty cool. My question is about um, more solid foods. Donovan's at a point now where he can actually eat uh, good amounts of stage three baby food. Oh, yeah. But we're trying to get him to a point where he can explore different textures. Okay. But it seems like typically um, when we do try different textures with him, that's not something submerged in sauce or you know like fruits or mashed down or whatever he just spits them right out okay yes and um do you work with a speech pathologist or an occupational therapist we have ot and pt okay uh and does ot work with feeding um our the one through early intervention does work with feeding and the one well okay. we had a speech therapist that was doing feeding and speech also okay well, maybe ask that therapist if she knows much about how to help the child who is um, starting to spit out some textures. Because when I was talking up there about the stages of the um, graininess of foods, it sounds like he needs to go through that a little bit more than that abrupt chunk. 
or that, you know, that thing that's going to kind of stick and stand out and that's food that he's going to spit out. Um, side placement of foods are really helpful for kids. So if that piece of food he tends to spit out, it might just be because he doesn't have side to side tongue movement. So automatically he's going to, and it's going to automatically come out. Well, what he does is he kind of, he does have the side to side uh, okay. tongue movement, but he'll kind of use the movement to push it towards the front. Okay. And then he'll just. So if you give him a out. bite of food on the side, it doesn't stay there. It'll still come out. So if I'm talking to if it's something that isn't like puree. Okay. It'll come out of his mouth okay. like a piece of egg or, you know, a piece yeah. of bread or a piece now, of stuff in What if you there. took that piece of egg and you put it on his back molar and let him chew 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 on it? How does he do with that? Well, he, he doesn't really chew. Okay. He just so Okay. Plays around. This is great. I know exactly an idea of where to start with you. And the therapist that's working with you, if you want, and, and they, they might know, or I don't know if you've talked to them about this issue yet or not, but if, if they know, um, if they don't know, we could touch base and, and find out some ideas to start at the different at a different step in the hierarchy to help him transition a little bit better. Because okay. there are little tricks you wouldn't believe. And you're like, oh, really? You know, we just don't, because we don't have to think about it. But a child who doesn't know how to chew, who's giving foods where he really should chew, he's either going to spit it out and get really good at it, or he's going to swallow it whole and get really good at it. And you don't want either one of those things. In fact, I'd rather him spit it out because it's better for choking hazard and it's better for digestion. So he's actually doing something that's good for the stage he's at. He'll, if we can do some of those around the back, oral motor, jaw of resistance exercises with some of these tools, help him get there and then move it to foods with placement, he could progress nicely for you and actually end up chewing his food instead of learning how to swallow it whole really good. That sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, that would be really good. Thank so, you. Uh-huh, sure.